So now that we've walked through uh, Joukowsky airfoils, we're going to go through the more general solution um, for uh, for actually any airfoil. So going from the zeta plane to the z plane for uh, any mapping or any airfoil geometry. And uh, I'm going to follow along a paper that uh, I wrote with some students a couple years ago uh, that goes over the basics of this. And uh, this paper actually is focused on the aerodynamic center, which is uh, another topic that um, is interesting to study. But I'm just, uh, in this video, we're just gonna go over the general solution from, uh, from inviscid airflow theory. And uh, this paper, just so you know, uh, I'll go to the top of it. It's called Aerodynamic Centers of Arbitrary Airfoils Below Stall. Um, this was uh, published uh, as an AAA paper uh, in the Journal of Aircraft, um, and uh, but I'll leave a link to the preprint version of it that you can download for free, or you can download the actual published version uh, from AIAA. Okay, so uh, let's come back here to the uh, to the general solution. Here we go. All right, so. Um, this is our equation for a flow over a cylinder in the zeta plane, right? So that we're gonna call this W1. Uh, so this is the complex velocity in the zeta plane as a function of zeta. And it includes an offset zeta naught, so that cylinder can be uh, moved relative to the, uh, to the origin. Also includes circulation and includes an angle of attack. So the flow can be coming at an angle of attack. So this is just the general flow solution over that cylinder in the zeta plane. And uh, we know that we can map that to another um, uh, from from uh, the plane of the cylinder to a different plane by using this uh, this potential two as a function of z is equal to the potential uh, uh, potential one where this is the the complex velocity here this is a complex potential uh, corresponding to that um, where we plug in a z uh, zeta of z. So we can plug in zeta as a function of z, where that zeta of z is our mapping between uh, between the two. And uh, so if we do that, then uh, w2 is just the derivative of, of uh, our complex uh, potential uh, with respect to z. Um, and, uh, and we can swap that out for, uh, for the derivative of the complex potential um, uh, w1 uh, or the yeah the the um, potential velocity here um, w1 of zeta of z divided by dz d zeta so anyway this is just um, this is just another form of w2 as a function of z um, it's equal to w1 of, of zeta of z divided by the derivative uh, dz d zeta uh, and so we've seen that before this is just a review um, Okay, so then uh, if we do that, if we plug that in, so uh, we just come back up here and, and plug this equation in here. This is our flow over the cylinder. We're just going to plug it in here, W1, zeta of z. So we plug that right in, and then we have to divide by dz d zeta, which depends on our transformation. That's how z is related to zeta. And we're not actually going to specify uh, uh, what that is. Uh, we're going to look at it in just a general form here. So in general... Um, the, uh, the, the transformation between z and zeta can be written as a Laurent series, okay? And, uh, and the, uh, uh, the uh, Joukowsky airfoil just includes the first two terms of that. So, uh, so the Joukowsky transformation is uh, zeta plus uh, r minus epsilon squared over zeta. Uh, so th those are just the first two terms, uh, or, or really, I guess, the, the first term here in the Laurent series, and then that, uh, that, that term out front here. Um, uh, but anyway, so that's just, we can carry more terms in that Laurent series to come up with any transformation um, that we want. So, so we just write it in terms of this Laurent series. And, uh, and then here's some figures, of course, you should be familiar with. Uh, we've got our cylinder in the zeta plane. Um, and uh, in its offset, we're going to call that uh, C in the x direction and eta in the y direction. Uh, so zeta naught is the offset of that cylinder relative to the origin. And uh, of course, the trailing edge has to sit here on, on the real axis. And, uh, and then the leading edge also sits on the real axis here. 
Okay, and then that maps to some airfoil in the in the Z plane uh, with a with a leading and a trailing edge in the Z plane. Okay, so let's get back uh, to this um, this Laurent series here. This Laurent series has these coefficients, which in general can be complex coefficients. Now, in the in the Joukowsky airfoil transformation, uh, they were just real. Uh, R minus epsilon, both those are real numbers. But in general, this can be a, a complex number here. And, uh, and those coefficients tell us basically that they're related to the singularities um, in our flow. So uh, we can take the derivative dz d zeta of that transformation. And, and again, it's another uh, series here. And, um, and then from, uh, just from, from geometry of the cylinder, we know independent of the transformation, we know simply from the offset of the cylinder, c and eta, where that trailing edge has to be in the zeta plane. Okay, so we know where it is, uh, where the trailing edge and the leading edge are in the zeta plane. And uh, so that's what, uh, uh, well, first, I guess this is just the surface of that cylinder. The surface of the cylinder in the zeta plane is just a circle. That's the equation for a circle offset by zeta naught. And we can transform that entire surface by just using this transformation um, in this Laurent series, um, z of zeta, if we just plug in the surface into our general transformation up here, which is this. Uh, so if we just plug in the surface zeta, then we get z uh, surface on the right-hand side. So this is, this is the surface of our geometry in the z plane, okay? Okay, um, so then talk about uh, about these uh, c sub n so um so the the uh, uh the c sub n uh, these values of zeta are often referred to as the critical points of the transformation um and and these are the places where the where we have singularities in the zeta plane okay and um Okay, so um, all, all of, well, one of the critical points must lie on the circular cylinder in the zeta plane at the point that maps to the airfoil's trailing edge in the z plane. All the remaining critical points must lie inside the circular cylinder in the zeta plane in order for the flow external to the cylinder to remain conformal. So that's all pretty important stuff uh, to remember. So one of the critical points has to lie at the trailing edge. The remainder of those points um, have to be inside of the circle, so they're inside of the geometry once we get over to the z-plane. Um, and, uh, and so for the following analysis, uh, we constrain this to assume that there's just a single um, single trailing, trailing edge, uh, and so one of these critical points lies at the trailing edge. All right, so uh, with that in mind, we can just use geometry from the figure above to figure out where the trailing edge is located. Um, and uh, so you can write it two different ways in terms of C and eta or in terms of the, the circular circle plus uh, uh, zeta naught, uh, where we use this theta t. Theta t tells us where, um, at what angle, in fact, let me just scroll back up there. Theta t here is that angle between the horizontal and, uh, and the line that, that goes from the center there to the trailing edge, okay? So we can write it a couple different ways. Um, and then again, this is the, the leading edge location. So we've solved for these before when we were looking at the Joukowsky airfoil, but these are actually totally general because they just depend on the, the, the circle in the zeta plane. We know exactly where the trailing edge uh, has to be and where the leading edge has to be just from the geometry of that circle. Okay, now um, we also know that uh, the, the trailing edge has to satisfy the cut condition. So or at, or the cut condition has to be satisfied at the trailing edge. We know exactly where that is. And so we can come back up to just our general uh, equation for, um, uh, for velocity. This is in the Z plane or in the zeta plane. Uh, in the zeta plane, this is just our general equation for flow over the cylinder. And we know that at the trailing edge, we have to have a stagnation point. So we can set, uh, we can plug in the trailing edge here for the zeta location and then set this equal to zero and, uh, and solve for gamma. And that tells us how much uh, 
uh, how strong our vorticity has to be or the circulation has to be in order to make that a, um, uh, a stagnation point. So that's all this equation is doing here. We're just setting that equal to zero where we've plugged in that trailing edge here for the zeta location. And then we can solve for gamma. Um, and then um, we can also, uh, let's see, this is just uh, rearranging some, some things here. This is zeta t minus zeta naught. You can uh, you can write it uh, these different ways just using the trigonometry out of that the drawing of the circle. Okay. So, uh, so this is just another way to write gamma. After we plug that in, this is the circulation strength. And you can see that it's related to the offset uh, eta naught and also alpha, uh, the angle of attack. Okay, then, then uh, once we know gamma, um, we know lift because uh, uh, lift uh, from the Kutta-Joukowsky law is just related to gamma through this rho v infinity gamma. So we just multiply this guy by rho v infinity. We get this equation for lift. And, um, and, then, uh, and then we can non-dimensionalize that to get to a lift coefficient. It's just the lift divided by 1 half rho v infinity squared, uh, zt minus zl. So zt and zl are the leading and trailing edges of the airfoil in the z plane, OK? In order to find those, we actually need the transformation. Um, but it turns out that that this equation for lift is completely independent of our transformation. This tells us the actual dimensional lift uh, is only related to the strength of the circulation, and that circulation was just driven by uh, the offset of the cylinder because we know where the trailing edge uh, of the airfoil has to be um, on the cylinder. And so um, anyway, so this equation here is completely independent of the uh, transformation. Once we go to non-dimensionalize it, we actually have to know something about the transformation because we, we need to know um, uh, where, the, where the leading and trailing edges are in the Z plane. And so we can rewrite that uh, like this, where um, that ZT minus ZL is a constant. It moves out front. Uh, and so this equation now can be rewritten in a more general form, um, the, the lift coefficient is simply some constant times sine of alpha, we've got the sine alpha right there, minus tangent of alpha L0, that's our zero lift angle of attack, and that's this constant right there, times the cosine of alpha. So this equation right here uh, is the general form, let me put it in a different color here. So this is the general form of lift as a function of angle of attack. This first term has to be a constant from, uh, from, uh, uh, from conformal mapping. We know that this is, this is just going to be a constant. Once we know uh, what ZT and ZL are, the rest of this is just a constant. So that, that, uh, that term up front is a constant. And then we know that lift has to be related to angle of attack. It's got a sine term and a cosine term. And, uh, and then another constant sitting right here, uh, this tangent of alpha L0. Okay. So um, so this, is, uh, this term right here is what we call the lift slope at zero degrees angle of attack, okay? This is, this is really only the lift slope as alpha gets really small. Um, but in general, uh, we find that the, the lift as a function of angle of attack, uh, CL as a function of alpha, is not a straight line. Um, as is assumed from thin airfoil theory. So thin airfoil theory says that's a perfectly straight line. In general, it's actually not exactly a perfectly straight line. Um, but you actually, if you, if you plot solutions for most airfoils, it will look so straight that you wouldn't even know that it wasn't a straight line unless you added another straight line there to compare to. Um, so the curvature really isn't significant. So, um, so it's not that big of a deal, but, but we'll see that when we look at the aerodynamic center, um, that curvature actually matters. It, but, but for computing lift as a function of alpha, it really doesn't make that big of a difference. Okay, so, so CL alpha, or, or the lift slope at zero lift angle of attack, depends on our transformation. ZT minus ZL depends on the transformation. Um, then we've got the sine alpha and the cosine alpha. But this term here, the tangent of alpha L0, actually is independent of our transformation. Notice that it comes from this term right here. So it doesn't actually matter what transformation 
uh, we're using, whether it's Schakowsky or, or any of the others that are possible, um, the zero lift angle of attack is actually already defined simply by the location of the cylinder in the zeta plane. Okay, so uh, anyway, these are just some really interesting findings. Um, all right, so this is just uh, already saying, you know, saying what we said before. Um, there's CL0 alpha, it's related to this transformation here, and then alpha L0 is independent of our transformation, um, uh, only related to the, the location of the cylinder. So let's read what's in bold here. Uh, equation 42 is a general form for the lift coefficient of an arbitrary airfoil. No assumptions of camber, thickness, or small angle of attack were made in the development of equation 42. Therefore, we would expect this form of equation to fit the potential flow lift properties of any arbitrary airfoil with a single trailing edge at arbitrary angles of attack. Okay, so this again, uh, I'll just come back to it. This is a pretty important equation. This shows us exactly how lift is related to angle of attack for any airfoil uh, in a potential flow. Okay, we haven't made any assumptions for thickness or camber uh, or small angles of attack. Uh, this relationship should hold, and we're going to actually show here in just a minute that it does hold uh, in general for airfoils. Okay, now we can get into the pitching moment. Uh, the pitching moment we compute from the Blasius relations. And uh, so this is the equation from the uh, for the pitching moment, we just need the real component of this integral. This integral is actually pretty nasty. Um, this is W2 of Z, and we've got to square it. So this is it squared. And uh, remember, this is that derivative, the dz d zeta that's in the denominator. Um, then we've also got this Z term and the, d and the dz term. Uh, both of those terms, we have to switch into zeta in order to, um, uh, to plug into this equation here. So we're going to have some some function of zeta squared, we're going to have another function of zeta that, that comes from this z, uh, the z term, and actually the d zeta term, that, how those are related, um, and then d zeta becomes our variable of integration. We integrate, um, we integrate around a circle in the zeta plane. Um, remember, that's, that's a simple way to, to perform this integration. And so we, we integrate on the surface of a, of a circle, and uh, this just walks through some of the intermediate steps of doing that. Um, but what we find is that we end up with, um, with this equation here, where we, we're going to have a whole bunch of uh, coefficients, these b sub n coefficients. And here's a few of the first ones. There's b0, b1, b2, and then there are others. And uh, actually, when we solve uh, this integral, when we integrate uh, this around in a in a perfect circle in the in the zeta plane, uh, we find that b two is the only term that uh, that affects the the pitching moment. Okay, the rest of the terms fall out, and so um, it turns out the b two is related to c one. You can see that here. So inside of the b two term, we have a c one term. So that's our very first uh, coefficient. Um, in, in our Laurent series of the transformation. Um, and so we find that the pitching moment only depends on that very first term, C1. And, uh, and then we can, uh, here we, we've got a gamma that, that has you know, been in, in this uh, problem from the beginning. Um, and that's because our, our velocity here had a gamma in it. So anyway, that shows up here in the solution. We can swap that out. Using the Kutta-Joukowsky law, we can we can make that into a, a lift instead. Uh, so we've got the pitching moment related to lift, and uh, and we come up with this equation right here. So uh, C1 depends on our transformation. We we know that that's the first coefficient of our transformation. So in general, the pitching moment actually does depend on the transformation, where the lift the dimensional lift per unit span actually is independent of the transformation. Uh, but the pitching moment depends on the transformation. Um, and then um, we can write that in a non-dimensional form uh, down here. So here's our pitching moment at the origin. Uh, this is how we non-dimensionalize it. Again, we need that the chord length. And so that chord length will depend on the, uh, on the transformation. So, th so this term here depends on the transformation. 
this term here depends on the transformation, but the rest, and, and I guess here we've got that in the denominator as well. Um, the rest of this actually, uh, well, and actually the lift coefficient depends on the transformation. Uh, the lift itself did not, but once we non-dimensionalized it, uh, that, that lift coefficient does because it's been normalized again by this uh, chord length. So anyway, you can see a lot of terms in here depend on the transformation, but in general, uh, we can write that, uh, oh, one more step here. So this is the pitching moment at the origin. Uh, we can say the pitching moment at any location is the pitching moment of the origin plus um, the lift coefficient, um, uh, and, and we can move it around to an X and Y location, okay? So we can look at the, the pitching moment at some X, Y location. So, and so this, this equation here is really the more general solution to pitching moment uh, at any location where we can plug in an X and a Y here. Okay, so uh, what we see here though is that this term is simply a constant. Once we know the transformation, that's a constant. Uh, X minus uh, C naught here, that is also a constant. Actually that divided by that and then uh, and then, of course, this guy divided by that is also a constant. So what we end up with is a pitching moment equation that looks like this. So the pitching moment, uh, let's see, that's uh, do we rewrite that? I don't think so. So the pitching moment at any point can be written as some constant times the sine of 2 alpha uh, plus another constant times the lift coefficient and cosine alpha minus another constant times CL sine alpha, okay? And we chose names for these constants. Um, this is, you know, CM naught alpha. Um, this is uh, just a term that we chose there for that uh, first constant. Um, the second one, see CL cosine alpha is really your normal force according to inviscid potential flow theory. And so we, we basically say this is a change in your pitching moment with normal force. Um, and then same here, this is an axial force. And so this, this guy here is the, the pitching moment with respect to axial force. So anyway, these, these, the, what we're calling these is just a little bit arbitrary. But basically, to, to correctly predict the pitching moment of an airfoil, you have to know these three constants. Um, uh, and then uh, it should follow this equation exactly. So this is... A very key equation that um, that all airfoils should obey this this relationship between pitching moment and as a function of angle of attack. Okay. All right. Um, so again, all we're saying here is that 42 and 58. This is the lift equation and the pitching moment equation hold for any arbitrary transformation, and therefore should accurately match the potential flow solution for any arbitrary airfoil with a single trailing edge. These relations were developed without any approximations for airfoil thickness, camber, or angle of attack, and are not constrained under the same li limitations that were used in the development of the traditional small camber and small angle of attack relations given above. So um, uh, anyway, these are the general solutions for lift coefficient and pitching moment. Now, um, so now the question is, how do we determine are the coefficients that go into those equations. Well, if we're using a Joukowsky transformation, this is uh, that transformation. And uh, so we can just plug that in. And so these are all the coefficients that go into those equations for the Joukowsky airfoil. Uh, and we've, we've obviously already gone through that. So you should uh, recognize some of those terms like, uh, like this uh, CL alpha term. Um, alpha L0 actually is independent of the transformations. That's true for any airfoil. Uh, but here's our, our trailing edge and leading edge location. Uh, C1 is the, that, uh, is the numerator there in that Laurent series, that first coefficient. Um, anyway, and then we've got these three, CM0, alpha, CMN, and CMA, that you can get from the Joukowsky transformation. But in general, we don't have that. And so we also talk about, you know, most airfoils weren't developed using a a conformal mapping method. And so how would you come up with these uh, solutions? Well, what you would do is you would use a least squares fit to th the data in order to fit those equations, the lift and the pitching moment, uh, to um, uh, those equations to the data that you have, just like we would 
usually, you know, for, for uh, traditional approximations of lift and pitching moment, we simply fit an equation to those. We assume that they're linear, at least from, from traditional approximations, we say that lift and pitching moment are linear, so we would just fit a line through the data. Well, we're doing the same thing, but we're fitting these equations through that data. So what we did was um, uh, we took, um, uh, we did inviscid incompressible aerodynamic lift and pitching moment coefficient data for 150 NACA four-digit series airfoils. Now, NACA, digit, or NACA four-digit series were not developed using conformal mapping methods. So, um, so we took 150 of those and uh, we used a vortex panel solution with, uh, with 400 panels and we ran that from minus 15 to 15 degrees uh, in increments of one degree for each of these airfoils, and then we fit them to the uh, uh, to the traditional lift and pitching moment equations, and and then we also fit them to these new lift and pitching moment equations um, that we've developed here. And uh, so here's just an example. So coefficients for the NACA twenty four twelve airfoil. Um, if you fit those to uh, results for thin airfoil theory, remember thin airfoil theory has a, a lift slope zero lift angle of attack, and the pitching moment at the quarter cord. That's, that's how, from thin airfoil theory, that's how the lift and pitching moment are defined by those three coefficients. And so if you fit the data to those equations, then you get a, these values here for the, uh, for the lift slope, the zero lift angle of attack, and the pitching moment at the quarter cord. And then uh, from this general airfoil theory that's derived above, um, uh, we also fit them. And so these are, these, this is your, your, uh, your lift slope at zero degrees angle of attack, uh, your zero lift angle of attack, uh, and then the three coefficients that go into your uh, the pitching moment equation, okay? So we can compare a few things, like the zero lift angle of attack here is very similar, matches out to three digits, um, uh, 0.038, uh, 0.037, almost eight. Um, the, the lift slope, uh, from thin airflow theory is off just a little bit from, from what we get from general airflow theory. But again, this is the lift slope at zero degrees angle of attack. And so um, so the lift slope actually changes as a function of angle of attack. Uh, but what's the, the key thing in this is, uh, is what we get down here. So that we can also calculate the RMS error from thin airflow theory. And uh, in the lift equation, we get an RMS of, uh, of, of a 0 0.044 or 004, and the pitching moment, we get this RMS here. Well, when we do this with general airflow theory and look at the RMS error, we actually get machine zero for both lift and pitching moment. And so what that tells us is that to machine precision, the equations, um, if we use these coefficients here, the equations go directly through our data to machine precision. There's no error between uh, the approximation that we're getting if, if we carried more digits here. We're only showing five digits or so, but uh, but if we showed those out to out to precision and then use those in our um, in those equations, those equations go directly through the data that we generated from this vortex panel code. Okay. But uh, but what this says is that it actually, the, from thin airflow theory, it actually doesn't go through the data exactly. It has some uh, some error in it. Okay, so we we repeated that for uh, what was it, 150 airfoils, um, and varied the 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 four digits in here. So this is just the example from the 2412. But for all cases, we found that uh, that we were machine zero uh, for every single one of those airfoils. So basically, the 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 bottom line here is that those equations um, for lift and pitching moment are general. Uh, any airfoil will match those perfectly any, in an inviscid flow. Um, they should match that form perfectly. So that is the form. That is how lift and pitching moment are related to angle of attack for any airfoil in an inviscid flow. Now, I want to point out a couple things in, in bold here. Um, experimental data is generally known to only two or three significant figures, which is the same order of accuracy as that obtained from thin airflow theory. Therefore, the significance of the general airflow theory is not that it can more accurately fit experimental data or computational results. You know, we, we shouldn't be concerned about the error from thin airflow theory, you know, if we're just fitting, um, you know, using these coefficients instead of these coefficients. 
the, the difference in our results is so small and it's within the accuracy that we can measure these things in the first place. So, so that's not, uh, uh, that's not really, you know, we're not, I guess, hoping that people will switch over to these equations necessarily for all of their work because the differences are really, really small. What we wanted to do from one standpoint is to prove, um, or, or to find exactly what the equations were uh, as a function of angle of attack, just from a theoretical stance, we wanted to understand that. And then secondly, um, the significance of the general airflow theory becomes apparent when second derivatives for lift or pitching moment as functions of angle of attack are needed, okay? So thin airflow theory doesn't give you a second derivative. It says that it's a straight line. The lift is, is uh, a straight line as a function of alpha, and, uh, and pitching moment is also linear as a function of alpha. So it doesn't give you derivatives with respect to alpha, but it turns out that when you're, when you're trying to estimate the location of the aerodynamic center, you actually need derivatives with respect to alpha. And, and so in that case, um, you do want to use these more accurate uh, relationships between, uh, for lift and pitching moment as a function of alpha.